And so when you raise your, raise your hand or uh, want to ask a question, she will be telling us what's going on. So I'm Kathleen Crane. I'm managing partner in LTC Associates, as Cheryl said. And I'm Neil Fashima, the other managing partner. And we'd like to talk a little bit about the heart and art of anthropology this morning. Uh, Neil is a, is a psychological anthropologist, and I'm a medical anthropologist and cultural anthropologist by training. Uh, we are communicators by learning. So, I think that there is not a more potent thrill, and this will be the heart slide, there's not a more potent thrill than when we have worked hard, posed the right questions, looked in the right direction, made the judgments, and discovered. Whether that's the discovery of an artifact or a cultural learning, it is thrilling and for many of us quite addictive. That's what gets us up in the morning and keeps us coming back to challenging the naughty or wicked problem. How much more of a description of anthropology could you ask for? It is the quest to learn and to unravel the problems to which others may find simple and often poor answers. This quest is good and righteous purpose to have in the universe. Next slide. But with the quest comes an opportunity which we figure is the art of anthropology. <coughs> that is, communicating what we learn to and with others through synthesizing, translating, teaching, and communicating. This is, for many of us, much more challenging than confronting the wicked problem or standing up to dull review committees. In this presentation, we'll explore some of the challenges to good communication and some ways to improving our means and methods for communicating our messages. Next slide. Now, for those of you we've insulted with the pictures, uh, we apologize. But when you search for images of anthropologists and archaeologists, these are the kinds of images that you find. Quirky, solitary, studying, questing. Note that there are lots of images for archaeologists, few for other aspects of the discipline. Archaeologists have good, dis have good visuals. The rest of us, for the rest of us, the images are just geeky. <laughs> So, who most often becomes an archaeologist and anthropologist? If this is an interactive oh, who, 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 who becomes an, an anthropologist? Is, is anyone in here uh, anthropologically trained as well as archaeologically trained? Okay, we have, uh, yeah, we have about a half a dozen people. Great. So, both, both anthropologists and archaeologists what kind of people most often become who we all are? Any uh, audience? Uh, <clears throat> Nosy. <laughs> Nosy, I like it. <laughs> Anybody else? What type of person would do you think would uh, become an anthropologist in general? What would attract the person? Stand silence, Kathleen. <laughs> okay. Well, let me let me give my answer, which is that we are reflective, synthetic, thoughtful, and watchful. What's the mobile personality of an anthropologist? So this is not a rhetorical question. Okay, this is this is uh, participatory. So those of you in the room, um, who of you and this is raise your hand, we generally describe themselves as outgoing or extroverted. Hands up, please. Outgoing, extroverted, uh, half dozen. Okay. Then those of you who would describe themselves as more reserved or shy. Reserved or shy? Uh, another half dozen and someone kind of looking away and giggling. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have two hands up at this end of the universe. <laughs> so, here's one of our challenges. As a group, we lean towards the reserved and reflective, which often does not support a high degree of comfort in communicating. Next slide. In addition, sometimes there's a lack of time and space to communicate. And this goes to 
to what Joe was talking about, low and high communication style. Um, there's not enough time to provide a full message or sufficient space to write about it. Uh, we finished one project where our report was 500 pages, which was quite entertaining. Um, our client asked us to reduce it to 100 pages. Uh, and when we got to that point, they asked us to reduce it to 20 pages, and we worked with a very high-powered communication firm to do that. And when we finished that version, they asked us to reduce it to five pages and brought another communication firm to work with them. This was quite a remarkable experience because we thought the 500 pages was sort of an adequate representation of the work. The five pages were very startling because this went to a policy briefing and a practice change. And consequently, people didn't have time to read our wonderful 500 pages. And after a couple of briefings, I was pretty sure nobody read even the five pages. <laughs> but trying to get our information into a compact, presentable document is a major challenge. The, the, the necessary elements of information that we want people to understand is complexity, it's synthesis of very complex data, and the analysis takes us into realms that most people never go into. And then there's the challenge of how we value our information, and sometimes an unwillingness to reduce the complexity of our learning in order to fit with the time and space available, and to communicate outwardly to audiences who do not speak our language, as Joe points this out quite nicely. As anthropologists, as professionals, as social sciences, as adults, all these require different types of communication. We as anthropologists know important things. And our challenge is to find the means to communicate those things clearly to diverse audiences in ways that do not offend our own sensibilities. And that means coming to terms with the tension between our desire or need to communicate and our sensibilities about the message itself. We frequently present to professional audiences about anthropology, about our evaluation findings, and about our firm. We also make presentations to community audiences regarding the findings of our work. By far, the most challenging presentation has been to a series of second grade classes in the United States primary school. Children approximately eight years old. And the challenge was to teach them something about being an anthropologist, briefly, in ways and words that they could understand and connect with. When we started this little endeavor, we were very daunted at the prospect and ended up having a highly visual presentation with few words on the screen and simple explanations of what kind of anthropologists exist and what we study and do. These second graders had amazing questions about anthropology and anthropologists. They were curious and excited about what anthropology is and could be. How do we go from that kind of enthusiasm and excitement to a lecture hall full of students focused on the smartphone? How do we kindle and sustain that wonder and enthusiasm for arguably the most fascinating discipline in the known universe? And here are a few slides from that presentation. Next slide. Yep, going through them. And the kids absolutely got the archaeology slide. They were fascinated. They had lots of background information about archaeology. The next slide was where we talked about how people think about important people and events in their lives and how we have commonality across cultures. The kids were fascinated by this. They had not thought about anthropologists as studying those kinds of events. The next slide, we asked them about what kinds of tools they think that we as anthropologists and archaeologists would use. And we set them a small challenge. We said, so which one do you think is the most important and why? Um, many of them rightly guessed the brain. Next slide. And this one was to show the kids that even, even computer jockeys get to the field. <laughs> a hard thing to visualize. What we do is not very visually exciting or interesting. And so we threw this slide out. Archaeology is much more easily illustrated than cultural or medical anthropology. And for the deeply curious in the room, we were at the ruins of Namadol on Pompeii in the Federated States of Micronesia in the Western Pacific Ocean when this picture was taken. And we will not tell you how long ago that picture was taken. <laughs> Next slide. 
Okay, Carol, if you can jump to the slides and start out with who? With what? Who? Got it. Okay. Generally, we ask lots of questions we are, when we are asked to speak. Who will be in the room? How old or young will they be? What brings them together? How much will they know about us and what we do? How diverse will they be in terms of culture, education, interest? The more diverse, the simpler the messages need to be in order to capture the full range of the audience. We are particularly interested in knowing how much they may know about what we will discuss. Are they other anthropologists? Are they archaeologists? Are they anthropology students, health professionals, evaluators, a college audience, a lay audience? The more we can calibrate their closeness to our center, the better we can gauge how to communicate with them. Next slide. Okay, just FYR, our lovely uh, room steward has just said we have five more minutes. Perfect. So the point of communication. For your essential message, is what do you want them to take away from your presentation? About you, about your work, about archaeologists, about your findings, about the consequences of future implications. We need to be specific and strategic in what we decide to communicate. If we have ten minutes, Pick a very few items on which to focus. If we had to administer pre and post tests, what would be the key issues on which we would judge our success in communicating? Do they need to have a general grasp of our content, an in-depth knowledge, skills, competency? Depending on our purpose for their learning, we will need to carefully calibrate the shape and depth of our communication. Next, next slide. First, what are the modes of communication that are required and most desirable? If you are presenting to a professional audience, those may be prescribed or at least recommended. A fellow talk accompanied by a PowerPoint presentation is the most often found format. We often present as a team, as we're doing now. One of us can be presenting while the other is watching the audience and handling visuals, which we can't do. And then we change to the other presenting. This has many advantages. First, we can give the audience's response to the presentation and be prepared to shift points if we are losing them. And I hope you're all still with us. We also change voices. This keeps the audience engaged. Think about how you can use the format to take advantage of your communication. As you plan a presentation, remember that many people are visual learners and that words alone, whether spoken or written, will not be as effective as learning experience as, in the, as including visuals. Graphics, tables, and other visual supports are essential ways of serving your communication purposes. Sometimes creating the graphics also helps to focus and refine the central point, as graphics support a high degree of specificity. Often a combination of visuals and narratives is the most powerful way to present your information. It is sometimes important to conduct a didactic presentation. If you do, it's essential that each aspect of it be carefully crafted to leave the audience feeling that they have been involved not just lecture to, at, or on. This is the hardest format in which to keep your audience interested and engaged. Sometimes the timing of a talk or the format will not allow for interactivity. However, if you add features that appear as interactive, you will have some benefits in terms of focus and retention. For example, you can stop at the end of a point and ask the audience to think about how they might use the information. Pause for a moment and then move forward. Just the visualizing of use can have a salutary effect on learning. You can also do some visual polling, ask, asking people to raise their hands and answer to a question. Again, this has the effect of engaging the audience personally and keeping them involved in what you're discussing. If your time and topic allow, having a fully interactive format is sometimes useful and scary and hard to control and may yield really interesting results. This is the most difficult and most demanding and should only be chosen if the results are determined to be likely to overcome the potential for difficulty and if you know the audience well and if you are comfortable enough to fly without a safety net. Next slide. Fundamental is thinking about who you are in relationship to the audience. Will you have fake credibility or will you need to establish it at the outset? and without using degrees alone, particularly for non-academic or professional audiences. Do you need to create a rapport at the beginning of the presentation, sharing a story about the work, about how you were inspired to become an archaeologist, where you come from, etc., much as Joe did? 
Something brief that they can learn about you makes you accessible, human, and interesting. Next slide, please. Okay, we have about two minutes. Guys, there are a lot of tools for making presentations interesting and effective, and here are a few that we use. We are currently using all of these tools to illustrate a project in which we have hundreds of respondents in five ethnic communities and seven sites. Very complicated and critical that we make both our methods and our outcomes clear and accessible to our funder, which includes non qualitative professionals. Find tools that you like and that will help you better tell your story to your audience. Remember, you need to be constantly looking forward for ways of effectively presenting your story. How do you use social media? If you are teaching, what are your students using? If you are in the field, what are people around you using for sharing information? How do you capitalize on these media for your purposes? Next slide. Effective dialogue and communication, you need to be prepared, knowledgeable, engaged, and most of all, excited and focused on your audience. Think about the best teacher you ever had. What did they have? What did they do that made learning exciting, joyful, and interesting? That's what we need to do every time we communicate. We need to make people want to learn, want to know what we learned. And we don't always have good role models for effective communication. And so we must seek out those who help us to learn. Next slide. Time is uh, up. or the evaluation of a public health program. There's a story to be told. Our job is to tell that story well so that our audience gets the value of it. And we need to remember that all stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And good stories engage the audience and take them to the end without putting them to sleep. Not a nice end story. In this presentation, we've tried to illustrate a variety of means of presentation, some didactic, some interactive, some visual, and some narrative. We also hope that the stories we stop to tell along the way have been interesting, but have also helped to move the larger presentation forward. And finally, we hope that our passion for sharing our learning as anthropologists has been evident. We love a good story. Thank you. Next slide. Kathleen and Neil, thank you so much.